In this video, I want to focus on isotopes. Isotopes are versions of the same element that have different numbers of neutrons. Remember that the defining characteristic for any element is how many protons do you have. So for example, if I have an element with one proton, I know that it's hydrogen, because if you look in the periodic table, hydrogen has an atomic number, number of protons, of one. If I change my number of protons to two, that cannot be hydrogen anymore, it has to be helium, because helium has an atomic number of two. However, neutrons we can change around. Because they're neutral, they don't have any charge, and the defining characteristic of our element is how much positive charge or how many protons does it have in its nucleus. So we can have many isotopes of the same atom, for example, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37, that have different masses, 35 and 37, but they act the same because they have the same number of protons, 17 in the case of chlorine. Usually, when we write these things out, there are a couple notations that we can use. We can use this one, and in this one, x is our element. So for example, it could be chlorine. A is our mass, our atomic mass. And Z is our nuclear charge, which is a fancy way of saying number of protons. So our atomic mass is equal, remember, to protons plus neutrons. So from this notation, if we have this whole thing, we can deduce how many neutrons we have because we have protons and we have protons plus neutrons, right? One step algebra here. And the other way we can write it is our symbol dash our mass. So for example, this would be like chlorine 35 or writing out the name. And this is probably the way that you've heard it before. So for example, if you've talked about carbon dating, which is how we determine how old something um, prehistoric is, then we use carbon 13, right? Which is a radioactive isotope of carbon. And isotopes are not always radioactive because everything is an isotope, right? Everything is some version of an element that has neutrons. But certain isotopes can be radioactive based on their number of protons and neutrons. And there's no real formula for how to figure out which ones are. You'll always be told in the problem. So let's look at an example of two different isotopes. We have chlorine has two naturally occurring isotopes, chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. So this means that when people take samples of chlorine in nature, the abundance of these guys is that chlorine 35 makes up most of our chlorine samples and chlorine 37 makes up a little bit of it. So when you look at the mass in the periodic table for chlorine and it says 35.45, and you think, how can we have 0.45 of a neutron? This is actually a weighted average of these two masses. When I say a weighted average, I mean, we don't just add them up and divide them by two. We are going to add them up and multiply each one by a decimal form of its percent abundance. So we're basically taking into account how abundant it is when we're doing our average. Because if I have, like, if I have a class of students and almost everybody gets a 99% on a quiz, and one person gets a 10%. I'm not going to say, what's the average score? Well, we have 99% and 10%. Let's average them out. I'm going to take a weighted average based on how many people got 99 and how many people got 10%. One more thing that I want to address before we actually learn how to calculate average atomic mass as a weighted average is that in this table that I've given you with chlorine as an example, I pulled this from my textbook and you might be surprised to see that there is a row for mass and that it has decimal numbers because so far you've probably learned the average atomic mass is a decimal because it's an average, but the individual atomic masses of isotopes are just whole numbers because a proton is one AMU and a neutron is one AMU. So if you add up protons and neutrons, you get a whole number, right? Well, it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. So for example, we come up with the AMU by dividing the mass of a carbon-12 atom by 12. And that carbon-12 atom has electrons, and even though electrons are really tiny, they do make this really tiny contribution to skewing the number a little bit. There's also the fact that neutrons are slightly more massive than protons, 
And then also there are these things called nuclear binding forces and all this math that's like even beyond me. And to get to all of these explanations, I couldn't find them in either of my chemistry textbooks or any of the three chemistry textbooks. I had to go to the internet. So my point in this is don't worry about the reasons behind this, but also don't be shocked if you see masses that are instead of 35, you have 34.97. Instead of 37, you have 36.99. They're very close. If you're given these masses, use them. If you're not, use the whole numbers, like 35 for chlorine 35, 37 for chlorine 37. So in this example, we are gonna be using the mass that they gave us. But if they didn't give us a mass, it's not like, oh no, we can't do the problem. We weren't given a mass. We would then just use the whole number mass. And many of you will likely be doing that in your class. So. To get the average atomic mass, we are going to add up many products of two things, abundance of the isotope in decimal form and the mass of the isotope. So we're gonna do that product, multiply, and then add that to the same thing for all the other isotopes until we get an average atomic mass. So when I say abundance in decimal form, do you see the percents of like 75.77, 24 .2, um there are some typos in here. The correct numbers are in here. Maybe I should call them rightos instead of typos. But those numbers, for example, this should be, yeah, 75.77 is going to turn into 0 0.7577. How do we do this? We divide by 100. Why do we divide by 100? Because it is a percent. Percent literally means per 100. So we're dividing by 100. So anytime that you want to find out what uh, what something is when it's a percent of something else, you're going to take that percent and divide by 100, aka shift it to decimal places, and then you can multiply it by the thing. Like if I want to get 75% of something, I'm not going to multiply the thing by 75. Then I'll get 75 times the thing. To get 75%, you multiply it by 75, divide by 100. So that's how we get these two decimal forms of the percent abundances here is divide by 100 or shift over two decimal places. So we multiply for chlorine 35 and then we multiply for chlorine 37 and we get this number and when you're doing this on a homework you can check your periodic table and say is this number correct, right? Because all of our weighted average atomic masses are in the periodic table. As a side note with that, when you take your chemistry tests, you're going to be given a periodic table. So what sense would it make for your teacher to ask you what is the average atomic mass of chlorine and give you all this nice data when you can just look at your periodic table and see that it's 35.45? So your teacher is not going to do that. They are either going to have you work backwards by giving you the average atomic mass and all the information in this table except for one thing. Like, if I didn't have this abundance here, I'm going to outline it in red, then what I would say is instead of this, I would say x. And then x would be the decimal form of the percent, and I would solve for x. So what you do in these cases with missing information is you set it up as if you know, and then you put x where you don't know, and you solve for x. Good old algebra. And the other option for what has sometimes been done is they might say there is a hypothetical element or there is a new element that's been discovered on planet I don't know what and you are tasked as a scientist with finding the average atomic mass and you're given the data and it's not going to be an element from the periodic table. It's going to be something that your teacher made up. So that's how you might be tested on this. And we can do another of these problems. I have an example exercise here for us. So magnesium has three naturally occurring isotopes with masses of this, this, and that, and natural abundances of that, that, and the other thing respectively, which means you match one, two, and three with A, B, and C, one A, two B, three C, respectively. And then calculate the atomic mass of magnesium. So this is an example of one of those homework problems where you could check with your periodic table because magnesium is real. It will not be like that on the test. So we can take our masses, 
we have 23.99. I'm going to switch my color. 23.99. And these guys we don't put in decimal because they're masses. They're not percents. They're not per 100. 24.99. So we can guess this is magnesium 24, magnesium 25, right? And then we have 25.99. This is probably magnesium 26. With these kind of exact masses that are not whole numbers, if you want to know what isotope it is, round to the nearest whole number, which will not be far. And then we have percents. So, for example, with the percent of 78.99, how do we turn 78.99% into a decimal? Well, we have two options. The first one is to divide by 100 and pop this into our calculator. But it's nice to be able to do mental math. And the way that you do this in your head is you're just going to take this decimal and go two places. If you have a number that's double digits, like 10, 11, 78, it's going to be most of them. You just put the decimal point at the beginning of the number. If you have a smaller number, like an element that has, uh, not element, isotope that has 1% abundance, you can't really do this and you have to do two places. So if it was like 1.5%, we would do this and that, and then we would turn this into 0 0.015. So let's put these in. For the first isotope, we're going to have times 0 0.7899. And if you are new to me, my multiplication symbol may get confused for a decimal point, but I do this so that when I do algebra, I don't confuse multiplication for my x. And then we have 10.00. How do we express this? Well, we have 10.00, and we can put this decimal place back to times 0 0.1000. And we can keep the zeros because they are significant digits. And then we can have our last one is 11.01. .01. And this follows order of operations, so no parentheses are necessary. But it would not harm you to put parentheses here and there and there. It would calculate exactly the same thing as without them. In other words, uh, not in other words, uh, on the other hand, if you put parentheses here, that's going to be wrong. So if you pop this into your calculator, you're going to get something along the lines of 24.31. And that is the atomic mass of magnesium. That checks out. So I hope that now you're a little bit more comfortable with isotopes and calculating atomic masses. And if you get an answer on a test, let's say that we're doing the thing where your teacher says, we discovered a new element on planet I don't know what and your job is to find the atomic mass. And let's say off the top of my head that I'm going to say isotope. I'm going to call this element Z. And we're going to do whole numbers. And if the abundances here are 2%, 90% and 8%, then if I got the number of 31.96, would that make sense? Well, most of our isotopes, or most of um, our element Z, is in the form of isotope 31, right? So we would expect it to be nearer 31 than 32. And even within 31, we would expect it to be lower rather than higher because 30 has a more of a weight in our weighted average. It has a higher percent than 32 does. So even if we don't have our periodic table to check, hopefully now you know how to ask yourself, does this number make sense? And then if you're like, I'm not sure, how do I know if this number doesn't make sense or not? Uh, or does make sense or not, that's your next question is, how can I tell if this number makes sense? And that's going to save you a lot of time because that's going to help you realize like when you made a calculation error and how to go back and fix it. I hope you like this video. I look forward to making more.